Always fun to have a post lunch session, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So let's start. And uh, I am the moderator of the session. I am going to discuss with the very smart set of people that I have here product leadership in an uncertain economy. Let me set some context here. What this includes is uh, I have the easiest gig in town. I have a bunch of questions. They are very smart people. I will look smart. I will ask them questions, put them on the spot, and just enjoy. Right? And uh, yeah, m half of you are asleep, but I'm hoping you will wake up. Right? Cool. So the context, product leadership in an uncertain economy. If the last two years has taught us anything, is that we cannot take anything for granted. And the world is not very rosy now either. So how do us, as product leaders, change when the scenario comes into the picture? And before I actually dive deeper into Sanjit here, I'm a director of product for Booking.com. I take care of their data science and machine learning stack. I've done around 10 years of product all across the ecosystem and was a software engineer, actually a hardware engineer, for around four years before that. I'm a bachelor's of engineers in engineering, and in between, I managed to waste one year of my life doing an MBA. And now I throw it open to Esmeralda. Hey guys, I'm Esmeralda, leading product at Indicative, which is a product analytics platform for product managers like you. Um, I've been there for five and a half years. Thanks, Esmeralda. I feel full energized after the high five. Uh, my name's uh, Alex Thompson. Uh, I lead the EMEA business at Quantumetric. Um, we work with customers um, across all verticals and, and product uh, owners like yourselves um, to help them understand their customer journeys. Hi, everyone. I'm Vijay. I run the product team at Mixpanel. Um, I've been at Mixpanel about six years in, in a variety of engineering and, and product leadership roles. And Mixpanel helps product teams make better decisions uh, through product analytics. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And without further ado, let's start. So my first question, and I'm hoping it's going to start an organic discussion so that I don't have to refer to the document more, more than <laughs> once. Uncertainty naturally is leading to a lot of changes, right? Uh, we don't have a committed direction. But how do we as product leaders make some sense of this direction? How do we make sense in this uncertain scenario what we have to do or not do on a day-to-day -day basis? And Vijay, if you would like to go first. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, one of the traps is to be, to be reactive uh, to all the, the changes and feedback that you're getting constantly. Um, and I think one of the strategies here is to, is to decouple uh, strategy and tactics. You should be really patient on strategy, but really urgent when it comes to tactics. Um, and actually, when it comes to strategy, it's really about thinking about what are the things that aren't changing very often, things that are very you know, long-term and durable trends uh, that you can you know, really latch on your strategy to. Um, so for example, at Mixpanel, like, I think one of the, the interesting things is, you know, with, like, are we focusing on growth, engagement, or monetization at any given point in time? And kind of picking that as kind of a long-term focus area for us. Um, and then within that, trying a lot of tactics, right? Uh, you know, try building features, trying improving our customer success motions, iterate on pricing, things like that. Those are tactics that where we should define success and move quickly and, and react to changes. But we should really align on and, and be really clear about what's, you know, what's like the, the long-term strategy and what's, what's something that's not going to change for a very long time, because that helps anchor you when you know, you're dealing with this constant um, influx of feedback and, and you know, possible reactive changes. Yeah, makes sense. Alex? Yeah, I think, I think you make a really good point around those, those constant changes in, in, in the business and the teams. And I think I was watching one of the sessions earlier on. I think Georgie was talking about that, that team changing all the time around you've got your, maybe your best product owners become product managers, and they're getting all this new feedback all the time in as well. Um, so you know, it, when we kind of look at our customers and also in Quantumetric, it's always around how do we make sure we're focusing on the right feedback when we make those changes? Because there's so many inputs at any one point. Um, so it's adapting to that, but also still delivering the product that you need to for your, for your customers, right, at the end of the day. Yeah, and Esmeralda, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I would also argue that while we are experiencing and have experienced many macroeconomic changes over the past few years, if you look at just the changes that a business goes through, you're constantly going through changes. So Indicative, we were recently acquired by MParticle, so now I technically work at MParticle. <laughs> and that was a huge change, completely unrelated to macroeconomic situation. And then prior to that, Indicative was a 25-person company. So we were constantly having to adjust our tactics um, and how we are going to achieve our greater strategy. And the one thing I'll add to that also is it's important not to be afraid to place bets. 
So we instill placing bets as part of our culture. And so a few years ago, we placed a bet on data warehouses, the future. We want to build integrations to the data warehouse. And there was no other product analytics platform that was doing that at the time. So it was definitely a bet. And it has been extremely fruitful and uh, really, really, really helped us grow and was a huge part of the acquisition as well. Yeah, makes sense. I, I can uh, confirm with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good point, right? When you think about it, you know, outside this room, outside this kind of situation, there's a whole world changing economically, right? And that's impacting everything we're doing as product teams, as customers, as businesses, right, and choices we make. But if you think back to the last time there was a similar situation, financial crisis, a lot of businesses made bets in that period that they're still paying dividends now. And the reality is that I believe when you're thinking about product and how you kind of taken those inputs, making those bets and changes now are going to set you up for future success. So there is a a risk sometime, sometimes that you look at, we need to become more risk averse and make less bets. Yeah. But the reality is, okay, maybe you don't make you know, bets that are, you know, we know we're gonna fail, right? But the reality is sometimes that failure influences the next decision. So you still need to go make them. And I think that's kind of what you were touching on with yeah. those changes happening around. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. I, I, I just want to double click on what Esmeralda said. When you say small bets, uh, the data for the last two years was hardly unreliable, right? COVID, everything tanked. But how do you make the small bits? What, what do you base the small bits on? Yeah, I, I really like that, that concept of bets. And it's actually a, like terminology that we use in, internally at Mixpanel as well. And one of the things that we've been working on is sort of a, a bet template, like thinking about what is the anatomy of a bet and how do you, how do you describe it? Um, and sort of our framework there is thinking about, um, you know, wh what is the, the core user problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, what is the evidence of that, that problem? And why is that kind of a, a durable, you know, real problem that users have? Um, and, and also setting a, a, a risk appetite or a, sort of a, a tolerance. And this kind of like sort of setting appetites versus setting estimates are two very different things. It's not, you know, we're going to do this thing and let's estimate how long it's going to take. It's we want to solve this problem and this is the amount of time we're willing to allocate to solve that problem. And at which point we're going to, you know, set a checkpoint and, and revisit. And, and then, you know, final thing is like, how do you measure success at that checkpoint, right? Like, how do you define, are we actually, what, was this appetite fruitful in terms of achieving a goal? And, and to Alex's point, I, I agree, it's like, um, you know, either you make an impact or you learn, right? Which are both valid, valid outcomes. That, that measuring impact piece is, is sometimes, I think, what people forget about, right? It's, it's okay, we, we went and did this project, we made that bet, success, goal achieved. And the reality is, like, what impact did it have on our customer experience? What, yeah. what change did we, did we align to, right, in, in the, the customer journey? And I think... You know, you, you made me think, you said something that kind of sparked something in my head, you know, around you're making those bets and you're kind of adapting them to what the customer's saying, but I'm sure everybody in this room who's involved in product, they're balancing the vision of where they want to go as a company. And we were talking about in the green room, actually, but yep. the, the inputs you get from outside sources. And the reality is you have a balance at any one point. And if you're just doing bets based on inputs from outside, yep. then are you pushing it forward in the... You may be answering the problem, but not providing the right solutions, right? And I think that's part of it when you talk about the bets. I, I guess that's my yeah. perspective anyway. Yeah, makes sense. Actually, that's a good segue to my second question. How do we surface these small bits? How do we make our pods, if I can say that, more agile, that these small bits are more visible to us? So we are product leaders. What do we need to do and what do our teams need to do so that these small bits are more visible to us? Maybe Esmeralda will go with you first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think it's really important to, and, and you know, kind of double click on the agile part of that, mm. to understand that not every organization is the same. Every team is unique. They have unique managers, unique people, unique resources, tools even. And so it's really important to make agile like methodologies work for your team specifically and to not be afraid to try different things and be okay to dump it if it fails right like for example very small example with us we recently started to implement a lot more agile methodology and daily stand-ups don't work for us we tried it out we found two to three times a week is actually better for our team so that we can remain agile and not put in too much process right the process should be making you more efficient and it should be working for you you should not be working because there's a process in place makes sense 
video. Pro process, process shouldn't be a, a restriction, a gate to success. It yeah. should be, to your yes. point, making you more efficient, driving those those results faster. Sorry, I jumped in. No, Vijay, go yeah, ahead. yeah, sure. Yeah. I, no, I think yeah, those are those are all great points. I, I really like that point about process. It's it, it works for you, works for you, and not the other way around. I think one of the things that we we've been thinking about in terms of uh, making the teams more agile is setting up teams with all of the um, sort of skill sets and context that they need to be successful, right? I think one, one of the things that often um, hinders agility is when you've got a team that's constantly blocked on another technical function to perform their job. And I think this is why we're seeing this rise of these pods that are engineering product and design um, versus you know, having this more waterfall model where you're passing context back and forth from you know, the, the business people to the, to the technology people to the design people who might be in an agency. It's like, actually, let's bring those people together along on the journey, give them all the shared context. Like have, you know, it's not just the PM doing customer calls. It should be the design lead and the engineering lead that are, that are part of that. Um, and when you're leading with that context and, and you know, providing context around the problems, both quantitative and qualitative context, um, I think you know, high, talented teams make the right decisions and, and move really quickly because they're not blocked on, on yeah, the Makes sense. Makes sense in theory. But uh, let's say hypothetically we have such a setup. How do we democratize the decision making? Who is empowered to make the decision making in that part? Because let's say we have product hierarchy, right? So is it the individual product manager? Are you looking for the engineering manager to step up? Who actually takes a hard call to okay, pivot here or there? Maybe, Alex, you should go first. I don't know, Asmara, do you have a point on that first? Yes. I saw you jump in. I did, in. and okay. then I lost it. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go. Maybe we'll come back. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. to get it. Um, I think what you're, what you're highlighting for me, and I think feeds in what you're saying, Vijay, is if you're reliant just on one person, then the reality is you're probably not making a decision as a whole to the goal. Um, and f what I see in quantum metric is, and we see this in our customers as well, to be clear, is around breaking down the silos between those teams. And you mentioned like a, the VP of engineering or product or whoever, it kind of doesn't matter. The reality is that the, the, the data and the decision making across those teams should be the same. So that when the decision is being made, it's actually not a decision with a, this is something that contradicts what everything else is telling us. It should be aligned to the data. Now that doesn't mean you don't need decisiveness because obviously if you don't have the decisiveness, then you can kind of, kind of sway in the wind a little bit on what is the, what is the strategy. But when you're thinking about that, that agile motion, it's the clear goal, the clear targets, and the clear driving towards them, and the decision making on what they're going to focus on should come from the, the overarching data that all the teams have access to, not, not just one squad, pod, whatever you want to call them, in, in the business, potentially. Did that yes, instigate definitely. what you were going to say? It, okay, it did, actually, yeah. reminding me. So speaking of cross-functional teams and alignment between the cross-functional teams, so the way that we organize our squads is, you know, we work very closely with, there's the, the PM, the engineers, there's also the TPM, so like technical project manager, product, man or product marketing is part of it, and product design is all part of it. And so we have two-week sprints, we all meet on, those ch at, on that two-week cadence to make sure we're all aligned, we understand what's next, we talk about the success metrics based off of the projects we're working on to make sure that we are all looking at the same things and are aligned. So yeah, definitely reminded me of that. Um, the other part I think is really important to trust, to place trust on the team to execute, right? No one likes a micromanager, but in order to not micromanage, it has, there has to be an understanding on the vision, there's alignment on the vision, on how we're going to achieve that vision, and on how we're gonna measure success of that vision. So I'm definitely oversimplifying it, but those are some kind of three key components I see to make sure that there is alignment across the teams and you, know, you, you trust that the team is going to execute towards those three components. Makes sense. Vijay? Yeah, yeah no, I, I really like that. Um, you know, having, like, one of the trade-offs of having the teams organized in these squads, which is valuable in a lot of ways in terms of setting them up for success, is how do you align across pods, right? And, like, you know, if all these teams are going to, you know, their individual silos of meetings, how do you make sure you're building a coherent product that has a coherent strategy? And I, I totally agree. Some of that needs to come, um, you know, to some extent top-down or, or just kind of be decided organizationally um, consistently. Um, I think that that's one piece i think the other piece is kind of having a forum for for review uh, and editing so it's, it's it's less about sort of like you know top down deciding this is what we need to build it's like problems come to the teams 
uh, and then having the teams feel empowered to come up and actually seek review and get input, and then you know figuring out ways to give feedback to the teams. Um, and I think that's that's an interesting challenge because you don't want that space to be the type of space where teams uh, you know are, are afraid to get feedback on, on what they're working on or come too late, and it's just a meeting where they get you know skewered by leadership, right? It's it's, it's more about you know it, it should be a helpful space to you know find out mis like root out misalignment and, and actually make a more coherent product. So I think that's another. Do, do you feel that's got to be continuous though? That kind of like you mentioned the two week kind of circle backs. Like, mm. it, it, do you sometimes find that that isn't continuous enough or too frequent? I'm just curious, just based on what you both said. Like, is that not the challenge? I think I think it's the both valid. I'm just yeah, curious no, about yeah. the timelines. Yeah, definitely. No, that's a good point. So I think going back to process and making sure it's not working against you. Yep. I think the two week cadence works to have all of those people in the same room, okay. but there's constant communication as we collaborate within each sprint, right? Yeah. You know, that's not the only time we, all, sure, we yeah. all talk. So I think, I think it's important to find the flow that works for the team with the different cross-functional parties, but it's important not to only focus on that, right? We still need to all regroup every two weeks. B because every, every team is different as well, right? Exactly. So just, just what works maybe for yourselves or yeah. us, it, it might be different for everybody else. And I think Definitely. it's sometimes good remembering that. Like I, I often find that, you know, you know, you hear Amazon talk about what they're doing or you hear Walmart or whoever it may be. And, and the reality is like, you sometimes go, well, maybe that works for you because you're Amazon, right? Or you're Walmart yes. or you're whoever. Yep. And it's finding that, that balance of what's the right blend, I guess, is the way I maybe describe it, yeah. of, of what you're describing. And I, I just wanted to hear yeah, your thoughts. Well, so. One thing to add to that, what worked at Indicative, a 25-person company, is not the same as what works at MParticle, a 300-person company. Sure. So we definitely have to adjust, and we've adjusted a lot and made a lot of improvements that would not have worked at our size before. So yeah, important to adapt and keep makes that sense. in mind. So makes sense. It looks very good theoretically. But how do you handle, we, we all work in big matrix organizations, right? They are bound to be cross-board, cross-functional disagreements. And especially with the way that we are proposing, it's an uncertain world, be very agile, agile in the truest sense, right? How do we handle the cross-functional, cross-departmental issues? Is there a modicum? Is there an experience you have? Maybe you can share with the group. Do you mean the issues, or do you mean the, sorry, just to clarify, are you asking about the Either. challenges? Maybe just give an issue, and how do you actually sort? Is there a protocol that you have? Um, I think the reality is when you're looking at, at, at those, those functions and, and those, those products, those pods, uh, squads, there are always going to be challenges that present themselves, right? And, and the reality is I'm a big believer in some friction is good. Right, this, I, I call it constructive impatience. And, and the reality is like, as long as it's constructive where you're creating those challenges and driving the right questions, just because we're doing something and you're kind of head down, you're believing it all the time, it's important that it's challenged because otherwise you, you, you're sometimes fully engrossed in what you're building in, in that sense. And that challenge I think is critical. I think that's where the, the you know, the. Uh, product marketing comes into play, the, the customer feedback pieces, I think that is where the input's good yeah. from outside that pod. So you, you want to encourage those cross-pollination of, of information because it creates the challenges and yes, sometimes it presents itself as issues as well, but I think that's where you want um, those leaders to step in and kind of give the direction. That, at least that's how I would view it. I, I don't know what the two of you would think, but... Yeah, no, I, I definitely definitely agree on that. I, I, I maybe add two things. Um, one is, you know, really aligning on on the user as the the one kind of um, goal that aligns the whole company, right? Like you oftentimes get into these disagreements, and it's like two teams are fundamentally optimizing for um, you know their own proxies. Like they're optimizing for proxies. Like what's good for my team, what's good for this team, and then we're we're butting heads, and it's impossible to get aligned. And then you know stepping that up to okay, but what's better for the user? What what ultimately is the better decision for for the user? And I think that that's one just it's more of a cultural thing, honestly. I don't I don't know if there's any particular process there, but it's just having that reminder and, and bringing that up uh, repeatedly helps. Uh, I think the other thing is having the product manager be the the bridge to uh, a partner team, like a customer success team or support team or something else, and having those teams actually plan together. Uh, like for example, at Mixpanel, one of our um, one of our product teams is focusing on, on scaling adoption of Mixpanel within organizations, and they actually have a shared KPI with the, the customer success team. 
And so they actually do shared planning together, and there's a synergy there where um, you, you, know, you can think about like, tactics that our CSMs can do manually, and then we see what works, and then we, we bring that into the product, and then vice versa. They can help drive adoption of certain, certain new features that we add. Um, and it's you know, doing that planning up front rather than, you know, saves you a lot of uh, sort of disagreements or, or misalignment on the, the later end. And so I think that's, that's another strategy that works. Makes sense. Yeah. And then a, kind of a, a new thing to add to that. So there's cross-functional between the product organization, right? And then there's cross-departmental across the entire company. So as product managers, I'm sure you get pulled in different directions from sales, marketing, CS. Everyone wants you to build what they want you to build, right? And so going back to having what those, that vision, how you're going to achieve that vision, and the success metrics is really important so you can point to something that everyone is aligned on and know that like you're all working towards the same goal and there are different ways to achieve that, right? And so it's, it, it can be really difficult to, um, to kind of have all those different opinions. But if you have that unified alignment, it can really help kind of sift through all of the, the fluff. Yeah, and just double click on that and, and tie it kind of from the, the current situation everybody's in on, on the economy and, and kind of, you're gonna get more of those asks because the reality is that like all of those business units are trying to get to their KPIs in potentially a situation where the market's working against them in some ways, like budgets change, budgets get smaller, uh, potentially they're, they're being more efficient with their budget, uh, where they're before, you know, the, you know, let's take retail as an example, right? Um, you know, retail's thinking about what's gonna happen in the next three, four months. You know, we've had the summer, at least in the UK, where um, people have spent money and so on, but obviously, you know, not, not to get into kind of politics, but obviously the, the energy rising bills and so on all over the world, not just in the UK, they're going to have an impact on what people do with their spend. So you're going to get more inputs into those product teams from all those departments, and it's about balancing those. What is actually the problem they're trying to solve so that we find the right solution versus just jumping from problem to problem and, and fixing the superficial ask, I guess, is yeah. maybe the way to it. That reminds me of something. So I was chatting with the, the head of product data, one of our customers. They're, they're a large gaming company. And we were talking about, you know, what's going on in the world, <laughs> looming recession. And their strategy is really doubling down on their existing strategy, right? So it's they, they understand their player journey. They, want, they already know the path that they want to get to in terms of what experience works with the players and they need to, um, you know, the strategy's still there, but the tactics may change and adjust. Yeah, and, and you've got to kind of focus on your, you know, gaming or in FSI or whatever it is, right? You're focusing on potentially, I'm going to use the word VIP, right? That doesn't mean that like the, the other ones aren't important, obviously, but it's around, as a company, you have to make those decisions, right? The, the loyalty is the key piece because acquiring a customer costs a hell of a lot more than building and retaining on one. So you've got customers who are loyal to your brand and to what you're doing and your products. You've got to invest in that space potentially. And maybe coming back to that's the bets you're making in the current climate mm -hmm. that tie back to that. Yeah. yeah. Makes yeah, I think, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And especially when, when double clicking on the, that core user, I think it's, it's often more important to focus in, in times when things are changing and, and uncertain, it's important to focus on, on user engagement and retention uh, rather than growth. Like you, do, you don't want to be you know, spending a lot to fill a leaky bucket. And oftentimes that means refocusing on your core product, right? Like refocusing on you know, user delight and you know, all the friction points and pain points in the core and seeing retention improve over time, which tends to, tends to compound and, and builds user delight. New customers will always still be like a, a priority, obviously, and, and conversion and, and whether you're trying to, whatever you're trying to do, acquire as, as a business. But, you're 100% right. I think it has to be on that existing customer base where you just, if maybe you are losing customers or they were bouncing back or going to other places because of the experience, you know, people expect a different experience now, right? In, in a different world, and particularly when money is tighter, they want to have a different experience from their products that they're using. So it's got to be, it's got to be better, right? And that's nice. Makes sense. Uh, in the interest of time, what do you th see the trends in our craft, product management as a craft? What do you see the major trend lines in the uncertain world that we are in? What should we as product managers, product leaders should be doing? How should we be structuring our resume, if I can say that? Yeah. I so, think one oh, obvious sorry. trend, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I think one obvious trend is with COVID and quarantining, remote, like the workplace 
has changed forever. You know, prior to COVID, we had office, like five different offices at M Particle, and now there's two, I believe, but the team has grown itself, right? And so you, we noticed Zoom, for example. Zoom blew up during COVID because everyone needed to be able to communicate, and you want to see your coworkers too. And so I think there's a lot of, there's a huge opportunity in collaboration tools and adjusting existing tools to work more in the, the current and I think future state of remote work. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, um, I would agree with that and I, I would maybe just enhance it a little bit from a perspective, on my perspective on what I see at Quantum where we were actually already a remote first company before this all started and um, I often think that in the, in the software world where all three of us are, are, are come from at the moment at least. Um, you know, I remember the days when you used to join a conference call and like the one who was on video was the weirdo, right? <laughs> like I'm sure everybody remembers that. Like you join a conference call, you'd everyone be off video and like one, one person's on, like I guess we're all on video now, like here we go. And now that's sometimes really the opposite, right? Because people miss that engagement, that collaboration. And I think um, it's about finding the balance, right? It's about the collaboration in that hybrid workforce and I think I think it's maybe too early to tell where the trends are going to go in the current climate, but I think what, what will always be at the center of it is, is that culture. I think that's what people realized over the past two years and will continue to prioritize. It's that culture piece. I don't know if you disagree or agree, but... No, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And actually, to, to add on to that point, I think the one of the interesting things of being in product, of course, is, is you know, influencing without authority. And I think um, that's even more challenging in the remote work environment, for sure, because you know, the currency there is trust. And the question is, how do you build trust in this, this remote world? And I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, sharing context about what you're doing, why you're doing it, making sure everybody's aligned and bought in, everyone's heard and has a kind of coherent picture of, you know, why we're doing the things that we're doing. Um, so I totally agree on like the, the rise of, like collaboration is kind of a, a table stakes tool and a table stakes feature in any productivity tool, because it's now kind of just, you know, a default. Um, but it's also about, as PMs leveling up on how do we build trust in a scalable way throughout an organization when oftentimes there's new people you've never seen before and then how do you kind of level that up whether it's you know some element of hybrid or, or setting up things where teams can come together and plan together or having shared metrics that everybody aligns on or you know writing notion docs and sharing it with your company it's, I think that's a great yeah. point because part of building trust is building camaraderie mm -hmm. and a sense of community within yep. a company and that has been I, I personally find that incredibly difficult with remote work. Like if it were up to me, I would see my coworkers every day in person. But <laughs> awesome. I would say I'm probably in the minority of uh, what people want. People don't want to go to an office, but they do want a sense of community within the company that they work at. So I think there's a lot, there's still a lot lacking in the world in terms of how you build that community. And I, I do expect those types of products to start to, to pop up as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I know, I know we're almost at time, but just one, one final point on that is, is that ability to build those relationships are what build the trust, yep. right? Yes. And if you're all one or all the other, I think that will have the impact in the current climate on, on what do those trends look like, and I think that will be where the influence comes from. It's are awesome. you meeting up as a team and building that trust together? So, right. yeah. Fully agree. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. So you heard it first. Uh, while the things are changing, our jobs are not going away. So <laughs> yeah, trust is still is going to be the Until key. Until the robots come. Absolutely. People are still going to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we are dot on time. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.